So let me ask you a question. How far can you trace your ancestry? Most people can only go back maybe to uh, grandpa and grandma. Some of us can go back perhaps to great grandpa, great grandma. Even if we're into genealogy, into looking into our ancestry, most of us could only go back maybe, what, three, four, five generations. And yet family history is very, very important. Here's an interesting genealogy factoid for you. Mr. John of Gaunt was the Duke of Lancaster, the uncle of King Richard II. He married his third wife, Catherine Swinford, at the end of the 14th century, a whole hundred years before Columbus sailed the ocean blue and, and discovered America. They had four children together. John was the oldest, then Henry, Thomas, and Jean. They went by the last name of Beaufort, uh, a castle, a French castle that John claimed but had never visited and certainly never taken possession of. John's father was King Edward III, and John and Catherine's descendants included several kings of England and many kings and centuries of Scottish kings as well. But did you know that 18 generations later, we find out that one of their descendants would soon be president of the United States? And it didn't matter this year whether Hillary won or Donald won. Both are related to John and Catherine. Hillary Clinton traces her genealogy to that youngest child, Jean, the daughter. And Donald Trump traces his lineage to John, the oldest child. So Hillary and Donald are related. <laughs> 19th cousins, perhaps, but they are related. Yes, yes. They're not kissing cousins, They're not kissing cousins no. And I doubt they're going to each other's family reunions for a while. Well, we're in a Christmas series entitled Incredible Christmas, and we find ourselves both this week and next in Matthew chapter 1. Now, Matthew chapter 1 is called by some the forgotten chapter of the Christmas story. We usually, as we're reading the Christmas story, we usually go to Luke 2, right? You Usually your readings will start in Luke. And we, we skip this chapter, this first chapter of Matthew, looking to get on to the good stuff. You see, the Jews of the first century they would find our attitude quite surprising. To them, the genealogy would have been an absolute essential setting for the story of Jesus' birth. Now, Mark and Luke, they start with the story of the birth of Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. John begins by telling us that Jesus was our creator God. But Matthew begins with Jesus' genealogy. If you're familiar with the King James Version, you know the, the word begat is used instead of the phrase, the father of. So the King James reads, Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judah, and so on. And that strange word over time has given rise to many strange interpretations. One day, a little boy came home from church. He was all excited about his lesson. When his mother asked him what he had learned that day, the little rep boy replied, I learned all the forgots of the Bible. What do you mean? You know, Abraham forgot Isaac. Isaac forgot Jacob. Jacob forgot Judah. As I prepared for my message this week, I spent a lot of time, and every week, in fact, I spent a lot of time thinking of the introduction. I try to tell a story, perhaps a unique fact, as I did this morning, or even a George joke, anything that captures the interest of those who are listening, and yet never once, have I ever considered starting a sermon or message with a genealogy? And yet, Matthew, Holy, Holy Spirit inspired as he was, did just that. Now, 2 Timothy 3.16, you may be uh, familiar with that, says all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable. But I usually find the genealogies quite boring and a little less profitable than some of the other scriptures. And you may join me in that. I know quite a few folks who've read the Bible cover to cover and yet when you dig a little deeper, most of them will sheepishly admit they read through some portions of the Bible a little faster than others. So I find Matthew's introduction just a little bit surprising. I mean, think of it. A genealogy serves as the introduction to the first book of the New Testament, the first chapter of the first book of the New Testament. So I imagine the Holy Spirit inspired this book had very good reason to begin it this very way. 
You know, in real life, there are many reasons for people to be interested in genealogies. My wife, Karen, likes to breed Labrador retrievers. In fact, she's attempting to get puppies from one of our dogs right now. And whenever she's preparing to breed a dog, she goes online and researches very carefully the other dog's pedigree, his genealogy, if you will. Among other things, she wants to know what champions are in his bloodline. And, and if I if I were to hear of a wealthy man named Lawson had died and had no heirs to be found, you can be sure I'd be very easily interested in genealogy at that point. A number of people have gone to considerable efforts to trace their own genealogy because they want to know who their ancestors really are. But when we look at Jesus' two recorded genealogies, this one here in Matthew chapter 1, and the other one is mentioned in Luke chapter 3, anytime you start talking about genealogies, a critic, a Bible critic, might easily come up and say, well, wait a minute, this is ridiculous. Look at the two genealogies and compare them. They're totally different. See, Matthew's genealogy begins with Abraham and goes towards Jesus. Luke's genealogy begins with Jesus and goes backwards towards Adam. They also differ over some of those who are named. And we could almost think sometimes we're looking at the ancestries of two very different people. While some have concluded there's no solution to this problem, many others have thought otherwise with several likely solutions. Myself, I believe that Matthew's genealogy is of Joseph's family lineage, while Luke's genealogy provides us with Mary's ancestry. When faced with multiple theological differences, I tend to favor the one that makes the most sense, that answers the most objections and concerns. So Matthew's was a royal line, and Luke offered the legal line. With that, let's look at Matthew's genealogy. Verse 1 of chapter 1, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now genealogy, the root word of genealogy is actually Genesis. And we know that that book, being the first book of the Bible, that word means origins. And so this is really the origins of Jesus Christ, how he came about. Now the Jews routinely paid close attention to questions on genealogy. For instance, whenever land was bought or sold, the genealogical records were consulted to ensure that the land belonged to one tribe. And that land was not being sold to members of another tribe, destroying the integrity of centuries and centuries of ancient tribal boundaries. You couldn't just take some money and put a down payment on a deed. You also had to prove that your ancestors came from that very same tribe. That same principle applies directly to the Christmas story. Luke chapter 2 says, In those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world and everyone went to his own town to register. Think about that. That means that each man must return to his ancestral hometown, the town from which his family had originally come. But the only way that you could know for certain what your ancestral hometown was to know your genealogy. So Matthew's basically making a legal case for Jesus being a real person, a real human. He's saying, go to the temple. You can look at the public record yourself. Read it and see. The word Jesus. Actually, uh, Jesus was a common name at the time. Yahshua. It was actually the name Joshua as well. It's synonymous with Joshua, the Old Testament. And the word means he will save his people from their sins. And the angel said that his name would be Jesus because he will truly save us from our sins. Then Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, Israel's prophets, priests, and kings, they were all anointed. And Jesus Christ was God's anointed one as well. And Matthew then mentions two men of covenant with God. The Messiah would have to be a Jew according to God's word, that's the Abrahamic covenant. And must also be of the royal line of David, the Davidic covenant. And Jesus fulfills both requirements. Through the seed of Abraham, God promises to make a great nation. And through this seed, God covenants not only to bless Abraham, but all the nations of the world. God promised David that his dynasty would be eternal. It is through David's seed that the Messiah's reign will be forever. And so our Lord, even today, is referred to as the son of David. Matthew's genealogy is broken into three sections, 14 individuals in each of the three sections. 
First starting again with the line of Abraham, the second group being the line of David, and the third traces the generations following the return from the Babylonian exile. And in order for Matthew to achieve this order of three groups of 14, very orderly, very organized, he had to omit some names, of course, and so you'll see some differences in the two genealogies, and it only makes sense. This poses no problem because the Greek term uh, for the son of, or in our case in the King James Version, begat, refers to one's descendants. It might be a son, it might be a grandson, it might be a great-grandson. Frederick Bruner, an American biblical scholar, suggested that the first section, the one from Abraham to David, is an upwardly ascending order, finding completion finally in David. The second section, though, plummets from the kingdom at its very best. The kingdom had never been stronger. The kingdom had never been longer in peace than when David took it over. But it went downhill from there to the very depths, in fact, of Israel's Babylonian captivity But the third section, again, ascends when God delivers his people from Babylon and brings the remnant back to the land of Israel. Listed in this list, I'm not going to go through the list, mostly because I couldn't pronounce some of the names, um, but you can look that up later. Matthew chapter 1, verses 2 or 3 through 16. Many are names which we may easily recognize. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David, Solomon. And quite a few we may not. For instance, how many of these are you familiar with? Abahud, Eliakim, Azor, Zadok, Elihud, and Eleazar. Eleazar. But all of this to say that Jesus was a very real person, born in a line of very real people. And while all of those listed were sinners, as we all are, some of them were downright opposed to God's promises, to God's purposes. And if the fulfillment of God's purposes and promises depended on their faithfulness, as you read through Scripture, we'd be in a world of hurt right now. I like the way that Bruner himself again summarizes it. One gets the impression that Matthew poured over his Old Testament records until he could find the most questionable ancestors of Jesus available in order to insert them into his record. And so it seems to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel, that is, that God can overcome and forgive sin and can use soiled but repentant persons for his great purpose in history. In this great list of ancestors, Matthew also includes four women besides Mary, which was unheard of in Jewish culture at the time. None of these other women would be generally regarded as the most noble women of the Old Testament either. Each of them uh, brought some questionable baggage. All of three, all of them, three of them were Gentile by birth, and the fourth, Bathsheba, was a virtual Gentile because she married Uriah, a Hittite. In Genesis 38, we look at the story of Tamar, who's mentioned in this lineage. Tamar practiced prostitution and went beyond that and seduced her father-in-law, Judah. As a result, Perez and Zerah were born. In spite of the ugly and gross sins of incest and prostitution, they are found in the line of Messiah. Tamar is included in the Messianic line in spite of her treachery. Rahab's story is found in Joshua chapter 2. She also was a prostitute from Jericho who actually came to believe on the Lord and became a key part in the victory at Jericho. She is included in the Messianic line in spite of her past. Bathsheba gave King David a son in Solomon, but had also been the wife of Uriah. And only after the adulterous affair with David is she included in the line of Messiah. Obviously, God brought good out of the flawed actions of David and Bathsheba's adultery. She is included in the messianic line in spite of her sin. Ruth was a very good woman, but she was a Moabite, a cursed people born of incest. The whole nation and all its people were cursed. Yet Ruth chose to forsake the gods of the Moabites and worship the true God. And she is included in the line of Messiah despite her former gods. Two prostitutes, a cursed Moabite and an adulteress. The grace of God is manifested by recognizing each of them in the line of the Messiah. Interestingly enough, these women mentioned also represent different periods in Israel's history, in Jewish history, where a Gentile actually displayed greater faith than the Jews would. 
Tamar versus Judah's disloyalty, Rahab versus a faithless generation of Jews, Ruth versus the period of the judges when everyone did what was right in their own eyes, and Uriah, a Gentile Hittite, his faithfulness even when David was unfaithful. So it's probable that Matthew's doing a couple things here. Number one, he's showing us that the grace of God is very, very wide. And I praise him for that. Amen? Jesus is a friend of sinners. His grace reaches to the lowest and his grace even reaches out to the Gentiles. In other words, he is suitable to be a king of everyone, Jew and Gentile alike. But secondly, another thing I see in this is there's no pattern of righteousness in the line of Jesus. There are adulterers, prostitutes, warriors, heroes, Gentiles, wicked kings, good kings. And that summarizes the gospel of Matthew. Jesus came to save sinners. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus came to save you and he came to save me. Pastor Math Chandler wrote about this time that he and a couple of his friends invited a young woman, a neighbor actually, named Kim, to a gospel concert. Matt was hopeful that Kim would come to Christ that evening. However, what was occurred instead was a train wreck of sorts. In retrospect, Matt uh, was grateful for the experience because it changed the way how he saw to proclaim holiness in light of the cross of Jesus. He writes this, The preacher that night took the stage and a disaster ensued. He gave a lot of statistics about STDs. There was a lot of, you don't want syphilis, do you? His big illustration was to take out a single red rose. He smelled the rose dramatically, caressed its petals, talked about how beautiful this rose was and how it had been fresh cut that day. And then he threw the rose out into the crowd and he encouraged everyone to pass it around. As he neared the end of his message, he asked for the rose back. And by now it was broken, drooping, the petals were falling off. He held up this now ugly rose for all to see, and his big finish was, now who in the world would want this? His word and his tone were merciless. His essential message, which was supposed to represent Jesus' message to a world of sinners, was this, hey, don't be a dirty rose. Matt didn't hear from Kim that evening. In fact, he didn't hear from Kim for several weeks. Until one day, her mother called Matt to inform him that Kim had been in a very, very bad accident. And Matt immediately went to go visit her in the hospital. In the middle of their conversation, seemingly out of nowhere, she paused. Tears were coming down her face, and she asked him, Do you think I'm a dirty rose? His heart sank, and he explained to her the whole weight of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Jesus desires to save, that Jesus desires to redeem, and Jesus desires to restore dirty roses. He wants our dirty roses. Matthew 9, 13, For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love towards us, that while we were what? Still sinners, Christ died for us. The consequences of sin is always tragic, sorrow-filled at times, painful. If you've ever failed God or have turned from Him, if you've sinned against God and your own family, then you know that sorrow and that pain. From Romans 6.23, it comes like the pounding of a judge's gavel at the time of sentencing. We see Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. And if that was the conclusion of the matter, how sad we would be as a human race. But he goes on in that verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus Christ is our hope. The only one who can offer pardon and freedom and deep joy. Matthew 1 continues on after the list to verse 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who's called the Messiah. Now, why would Matthew, after all this, cause our attention to be drawn so specifically to Joseph? See, it's through Joseph that the legal line passes from David to Jesus. While Joseph was not the biological father of Jesus, he was the legal father and the reason that we can call Jesus the son of David. And he also uses this opportunity to declare the virgin birth. And we'll look more closely at the virgin birth this next week. For 14 verses, Matthew has emphasized Jesus' paternal human origins. 
Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. But in this verse, he changes the narrative dramatically. He doesn't say Joseph was the father of Jesus. He says Joseph was the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus. So what are some takeaways from our observation of this, this genealogical list this morning? Number one, I would suggest that God has a plan, and it will not be thwarted. Consider again the history summed up in this genealogy. It's marked by gross sin. Abraham, Judah, David. Blatant idolatry, captivity in Egypt, captivity in Babylon, a succession of flawed kings and hostile enemies, and yet God's plan is carried out in fullness to its completion. It's as if God is saying, the famine in Egypt couldn't starve my plan. 400 years of slavery in Egypt and another 70 in Babylonian captivity could not shackle my plan. Murder, corruption, and idolatry could not stop my plan. There are a couple truths we need to grasp from all of this this morning. First, when your life seems out of control, do remember this. God is always in control. And he wants to manifest his son in your life to bring you hope, to bring you faith, and to bring you peace. Secondly, we're comforted by the fact that God assures us that Jesus is coming again. And this time it won't be a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and obscurity in some little-known outpost. It will be coming as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Second thing I would ask you from this is what is your legacy? Have you ever heard of Sarah Edwards? No, Sarah Edwards. Sarah Edwards was married to Jonathan Edwards. He was an American preacher. And beginning on August 25th, 1728, children started coming into that family, 11 in all, at about two-year intervals. So you could say that this would be a good Mother's Day uh, message, perhaps. But in 1900, 172 years later, Mr. A.E. Winship made a study contrasting two families. One had hundreds of descendants of an adulterous wife beater. And throughout, you can see that not many of them mounted to much of anything. The other, the descendants of Jonathan and Sarah Edwards. And by 1900, when he made this study, this marriage had produced 13 college presidents, 65 professors, 100 lawyers, and a dean even of a law school, 30 judges, 66 physicians, 80 holders of public office, including three U.S. senators, mayors of three large cities, a governor of three different states, and a controller of the U.S. Treasury, a vice president even of the United States. Members of this family wrote 135 books, edited 18 journals and periodicals. They entered the ministry in platoons, if you will, and sent 100-plus missionaries overseas. What was Sarah Edwards' legacy? As you look back on her life and her and her legacy through her descendants, you can see that it mattered a whole lot. What is your legacy? How will you spend your time and your life? And to what end will you seek to do so? Matthew reminds us that Jesus is uniquely and rightfully the king of kings. This is important in history because the transfer of property, even today, requires proof of lineage and and rightful ownership. Since the destruction of the temple in AD 70, there's no genealogical records that exist today that can trace the ancestry of any Jew who is now living. Why is that significant? Well, see, for Jews who reject that Jesus was the coming Messiah, but still look for him, his lineage to Abraham or David can now never be established. Jesus Christ is the last verifiable claimant to the inheritance of David, I'm sorry, the inheritance of Abraham and the throne of David. And therefore, he alone qualifies to be the Messiah, to be the king. Knowing that, the third point I would say is let's worship the king. Let's be reminded to worship the king. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a Welsh Protestant minister, said this, Imagine that a friend of mine comes to see me and says, Hey, I was at your house the other day, and a bill came due, and you weren't there, so I paid it. How should I respond? Well, the, the answer kind of depends on the situation. I don't know how big the bill was. Was it just a few cents because there was some postage due? Then I would say, thank you. But what if the IRS had finally found you? What if you owed 10 years of back taxes? Until I know how much my friend paid, I don't know whether to shake his hand 
or fall down at his feet and, and, and kiss them. We serve a God who sent his only son to, a, to become a human being some 2,000 years ago, a perfect man who died a sinner's death to redeem you and to redeem me. He paid the ultimate price to redeem us all. At Maranatha, we honor the Bible as, as life's instruction manual, but we are not p- primarily people that followed some code of ethics. At Maranatha, we proudly seek to follow Jesus wherever that may lead us, but we are not primarily people committed to a certain philosophy. Rather, we are simply a people who follow, who obey, and who worship the king. Number four, we need to recommit our lives to the king. Jesus once gave a parable. You may recall it, the parable of the four soils, comparing people to, that hear of God's plan for our salvation. Some, he said, will outright reject it completely. Some will respond to this gospel at first with excitement and anticipation, but they, they kind of fizzle out as time goes on. Some will respond with excitement, but then they'll be lulled away by, by drink, by money, by pleasure. But a few, Jesus said, will hear this gospel of the kingdom and respond and bear fruit and their lives will be totally different because of it. Do we want to be sons and daughters of the king? Matthew 12, 49 to 50 says, and he stretched out his hand toward the disciples and said, here are my mothers and my mother and my brothers for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. And lastly, I would suggest that if you are not already, that you too can be a part of God's and Christ's inheritance. John chapter 1, 11 to 13 says, He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but born of God. It doesn't matter what your background is doesn't matter what your pedigree is. doesn't matter what your last name is. As long as you fall on your knees, acknowledge that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior, that what he did on that cross that day some 2,000 years ago could have been done solely for you, and he still would have climbed that cross, still would have been there to accept that punishment, a, sin, a sinner's death that he did not deserve, and yet he took it for each of us. So as you accept that, as your Lord, him as your Lord and Savior, then you too can be counted as one of God's children. So as we're reminded this Christmas season, and we go past this forgotten chapter and go on to the chapters that really have the good Christmas stuff, the Nativity and John the Baptist and all that, let us be mindful of verse 1, that we need that genealogy, and that this genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, means that he is the son of David, and the son of Abraham, and rightfully, therefore, the king. Let us pray. Father God, as we come here this morning, we're mindful again through your scripture, through Matthew in an obscure chapter that so many of us seem to read by it right by or read through quickly if we read it at all, that your son Jesus Christ is the only one who rightfully fits the unique description of the King, the Messiah, who will come to rule this earth at the end. Father, help us to remember that. Help us to cling to that. Help us to know that when all these other pretend Christ and Messiahs come, to know that Jesus Christ is the only one who fulfills that role. May it give us comfort. May it give us strength. May it give us peace. And it's in Jesus' name we pray this morning. Amen.